Is this is this on? Yes, my lord. Good, good. <clears throat> Hello, this is God speaking. Can we dial that down? Yes, my lord. Thanks. Welcome, new arrival to the Eternity Ward. Please take a number and make your way down to the left or the right to the waiting room. All you need is there the refreshments I made just for you. <laughs> I would tell you to steer clear of the apples, they're forbidden, um, and the two snakes. <clears throat> I mean, fools, sorry, that are chewing the fat in the corner, but you probably wouldn't listen anyway. So good luck, I bless you, and on your way. Welcome to the Eternity Ward, where we drink cloudy ciders and chat with our buddies while we wait for an appointment with God. I'm Nick McKinnon. And I'm Chris Adams. Cheers. Clinkies. Hard to do over Skype. How you going, Nick? Yeah, I'm, I'm, how am I doing? I don't even know. That's all right. People ask me that question and I'm just like, uh, panic, answer the question. <laughs> and then I go, hang on, no, pause, Nick. Um... And then I think, yeah, I'm still doing fine. <laughs> so it's still the same answer. How are you, Chris? Angry. Angry? Yep. Have you been playing Angry Birds? No. Did you watch someone kick their dog? No. Um, I've just been uh, watching the news and hopping online and getting angry. What are you getting angry at? <sighs> well, today, Manus. Manus Island. Have you been keeping up to date with the news? Uh, I believe there's police on Manus Island, which sounds exciting. Yeah. It's just I'm angry at what's being done in our name because the, the refugees in Manus Island who have done nothing illegal, they've had their possessions taken and destroyed and they're being herded against their wishes into a place that scares them. And that's after four years of being detained in one complex without much hope of a resolution or a future. And so I'm just, they're scared and I'm angry that we're doing this to people who are scared. But getting online, you know, I thankfully there were many Australians supporting refugees, but then I get, you know, they, what do they say? Don't read the comment section. Not if you want to be angry. If you want to be angry, then definitely read the comment section. Uh, maybe I did. Maybe that's why I did it. But, you know, when you see your countrymen saying, you know, I hope you die, vile scum, and <laughs> ha-ha, you're never coming here, you know, I get angry. I don't think angry is very healthy for me, Nick. <laughs> So what do you want the government to do with these people then? Oh, look, I don't know. I just feel like we're creating a, you know, another stain on our history, which we're going to have to have a big sorry thing for. I know it's complicated, but it's just I'm, I'm annoyed about it. But I don't want to be. But we're not causing it. Australia has nothing to do with this. What are you talking about? What do you mean we have nothing to do with this? This is stuff that we're doing in our name. It's not our police force. We ordered another country's police force to go and kick people out of somewhere that we're responsible for. What makes you think we ordered it? Peter Dutton ordered it. Did he? Yeah. He, he can order the Papua New Guinean police. That sounds very unlikely to me. He asked for it to be done. I don't know whether it was, I don't know whether he said politely, can you please remove these people or I'm telling you remove these people, but it was his instigation. You don't reckon he just said, we've closed the centre, you guys go do what you want? He maybe he did. Yeah, no. well, that's different then. It is Papua New Guinea's country. Yeah, but he, he gave the go-ahead for them to go in and remove people that we're responsible for. I'm worried about it, angry about it. Do you remember that um, the, uh, the Monty Python sketch with the Judean People's Front or the People's Front of Judea? I never remember which one it was. No, I have no idea. I've, I don't think I've ever watched a Monty Python anything. Really? I've eaten some of those killer python snakes. They're really good. So he goes to join this activist group called the Judean People's Front or whatever, you know, and they're saying, oh, we're a hate group. And he's like, a hate group? And they go, yeah, we hate hate. I sometimes feel like that's the sort of hate group I'd belong to, uh, a hate group that <laughs> hates hate. But then I'm going, oh, hate isn't all that healthy for me. Um, <laughs> like I wanted to start a group called the, uh, the AACL-ACL which was the uh, anti-Australian Christian lobby, Australian Christian lobby. So just get Christians who are Australian that were anti the Australian Christian lobby to just lobby against the Australian Christian lobby. That's all that we would do. Do you think anyone would sign up? I don't know. I, I just thought it was a great idea. But then, <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, you know what? It wouldn't be very helpful in the long run because this is the thing with a hate-hate group is – I want to stand for something, but I don't want to be the sort of person just stands against something. So that's why 
when I see movements like love makes a way or something, that's, I think that's more helpful than the anti-Australian Christian lobby, Australian Christian lobby, you know? Like, <laughs> maybe when you're standing up for something, it's just that shift in perception that you're standing for instead of standing against that can make it a, a healthier way of dealing with an issue. But, you know, it's a free country, so people can say these hateful, vile things and stuff. But we're actually here to talk about freedoms. This is our topic tonight. Like William Wallace. They can't take our freedom. Freedom of religion is what we're going to talk about in the wake of the same-sex marriage postal survey. You're one of the 62%. So are you. So am I. So it's not going to be much of a debate. Well, we had a pretty good debate about that, even though we both agreed. <laughs> yeah, I think we can have a good debate about this too, because freedom of religion, you know, there are Christian groups who are wanting to enshrine in our constitution or whatever, whenever this bill passes parliament, if it does, regarding same-sex marriage, that uh, there will be religious protections put into it for people to be able to, I don't know, what? Be able to say no to baking a cake for a gay marriage, be able to say no to them being married within a church. Uh, I wonder if they could bake the cake. Yeah. But then write... Homo, you're going to hell on the top of the cake. It's a free country. <laughs> there you go. There's your answer. All you religious cake bakers out there. You can do bake it. Bake the cake. <laughs> send them a message while you're doing it. Problem solved. That's the thing. With freedoms, that doesn't mean you're free of the consequences of your actions. So, yeah, you can do that. But there will be consequences. With any freedoms yeah. that we have, there are limitations, Right. So free speech even. Right. So, yeah, you can tell someone that they're scum and that you hope they die or whatever, but that there are certain limitations. You can't just defame people. You know, you can get in trouble for that. You've got to be careful with inciting violence or something by what you say. You can get in trouble for that. So there are certain limitations. So the question is, what should be the uh, limitations on religious freedoms, especially in the wake of all this? What do you reckon? What do I reckon? Well, where do we start? Like, where's the line going to be drawn? Yeah. So in the wake of the, the postal survey where 62% of Australians said yes, same-sex marriage, 38% no, I think as far as I'm aware, there's been two separate bills that have been drafted by Liberal Party politicians, one by a dude, Dean Smith, who is supported by the Prime Minister and a whole bunch of other people that support same-sex marriage, who included in his bill, the protections of religious ministers so that they aren't forced to conduct homosexual marriages. Mm. So it included that. But then there was this other dude, someone, Patterson. I don't know. who is it James Patterson? I don't know. Someone, Patterson. James Patterson's a writer, but it might be the same James. Let's call him Jimmy. We'll call him Jimmy. Yeah, whatever. Pato. Because at least I know his name's Patterson. <laughs> he drew up a bill that was more supported by the people that voted no in this plebiscite, well, not plebiscite, survey. And so that bill included protections for not just ministers, but also for, you know, your everyday religious people who operate their own little small businesses that are involved in the wedding industry. So if they're florists or cake bakers or, I don't know, wedding dress makers or anything like that, that they the are able Photographers? To... Would photographers yeah. be in there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They'd all be free to decline to be involved in a same-sex marriage. Those are the two sort of things that are being discussed at the moment. Do you want me to go into what I think or what do you think? What do I think? For starters, when it comes to ministers having to marry anyone within their church, they already have in Australia, it's any minister, any pastor, any can already turn down any couple that wants to be married by them. They can just go, you know what? No, I'm not going to do it. But can they be honest about it? Can they say, like, I'm not going to marry you because you're a gay person or do they have to invent another reason? I don't know. You'd have to ask your dad. He's a pastor. Yeah. He can marry people, can't he? He can marry people. I'm cool with uh, any church that doesn't want to marry a homosexual couple within their church. I'm fine with that. I think that's a religious freedom that they should be allowed to have. Yeah. Is it discrimination? Yes, it's discrimination. You're making a, you're discriminating. <laughs> you're making a choice. But 
people often use the word discrimination like it's this evil wrong thing but we discriminate all the time like discrimination is choosing between different things that you know it's drawing a line somewhere it's just whether it's unfair discrimination is that a fair discrimination then for a religious institution to be able to say uh yeah not in our church i think yes should they be allowed to say i'm not going to conduct an interracial marriage because there will be religious people that say that. <sighs> yeah, man. Boy, I got you. Yeah. Oh, you got me. Because, yeah, nah. So, so the question really here is, like, already there's a protection for them to be able to turn away anyone they want. But you're saying now, can they say why they're doing it? Yeah. Because then that becomes... That becomes offensive. Uh, you know, yes, you should be allowed to offend people in certain situations. No, you're never that's... allowed to offend anyone, Chris. It hurts their oh, feelings. Come. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk more about free speech then, Nick. <laughs> you are allowed to offend people. Cool. So cake bakers should be allowed to say, no, I'm not conducting your evil, hellbound gay relationship. And ministers should also be able to say that. No. Why not? See, I have a difference where I draw the line. Draw me a line. Well, it sort of fits within the separation of church and state in that a cake baking business operates within a secular society, whereas the church is separated by this line where where the state doesn't have power over the church and the church doesn't have power over the state. So the church should be free to be able to say no, but a cake baker is not free to say no unless they're operating from inside a church. But no, I think operating within a secular society, your cake making business pays taxes and you fit under all of those anti-discrimination laws. You can't, I just think you can't do that. But religion should be allowed to operate outside of that. Yeah, but maybe not, but yeah. <laughs> Hold on, so. I mean, well, we have this separation of church and state, but I, I guess you need to talk about what that is and what that means. And also whether it just applies to your religion or all religions. Because your religion ain't the only one. There's other ones and you will consider them wacky, yeah. but they probably consider yours wacky. Yeah. So it can't be whether you think theirs is wacky that is the thing that works out whether it applies or not. Yeah, well, the separation of church and state uh, is sort of part of our constitution it doesn't call it separation of church and state, but it talks about that the Australian government cannot establish a religion. Australia can't identify as a Christian nation or as a particular denomination. My understanding is the separation of church and state, you know, partly why the church doesn't pay taxes as well, is that, you know, the state should not have power over the church and shouldn't be able to tell the church, you know, what they can do with their beliefs in the same way that the church shouldn't be able to have power over the state and tell them how to run the country. But you don't believe that. There's no way you believe that. In what sense? If there's a Muslim that believes in genital mutilation, yeah, you're not going to go, well, that's your religion, so, you know, go for it. We have laws in Australia that say that's not cool and Australian law takes precedence over whatever the hell your stupid Muslim beliefs say. And like some Mormons and Muslims and Christians will believe in polygamy. And, well, bad luck because our Australian law says that's illegal. We don't care what your religious belief says. Australian law takes precedence. Yeah, well, any freedoms, there are, you know, limitations. Give me an example of a religious view mm. that should be allowed to exist even though it's against the law for anyone that isn't religious. That, that's not the way it works, though. Well, that's what we're talking about with religious exemptions. No, no, but you, I mean, if you live within a nation, you, that whole thing of you, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's and you give to God what is God's. So within a nation, you need to abide by that nation's laws. They take precedence. Yep. And so Australia has anti-discrimination laws. Right. And so now that same-sex marriage has become part of the law, mm. that anti-discrimination will include the idea that marriage is between any consenting adult. Yes. That it doesn't have to be between man and woman. So if you want to deny services to a gay wedding, you are now discriminating because the law is that marriage is between any gender. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And so if you want religious freedoms for people to be able to say, no, no, I don't have to do that. Well, you are creating an exemption for them in the law because they are religious. And it's the same thing for priests. We're saying that you don't have to abide by these discrimination laws because you're religious. 
If you weren't religious, you weren't wouldn't get away with this. Yeah, but we already have religious exemptions, you know, within certain spheres, like hiring within religious operated schools and stuff, and you know, the wheels of our society they still turn. So extending some exemptions or maintaining some, I don't. It's not that much of a stretch to think that we can or might do that. Mm. But what I want to get to is, well, you know, how you framed what you said. Do you think a priest? should have to marry a gay couple if they cannot come up with a reasonable uh, reason that doesn't sound like just, you know, discrimination born out of belief. So I don't think there should be any difference between the rights of a priest choosing whether or not to conduct a wedding ceremony and the rights of a baker or a florist. Because if it's against their religious views... It's true of both the florist and the priest. There's no difference in why they don't want to conduct the service. But one's taken up a religious vocation where the other one's just taken up a normal secular vocation. Why do I care what they're employed in? Okay. So that being said, Mm. I think they should both be able to say, nah, I don't want to do it. Mm. I think everyone should be free to say whatever they think. Like, speech isn't what harms people. It's actions that harm people. Like, if you kick someone, well, that hurts them. Speech, we we have to be able to be open and honest about what our beliefs are and what our views are. And you don't want to force someone to pretend that they don't hold these views. And so I think that's true for the baker and it's true for the minister. And I think we just let economic realities take their course. So if someone (laughs) wants to be a if someone wants to be a racist baker that won't serve black people, all right, cool. Go for it. Uh, let every person that's black walk into that shop with their phone on, record it, post it to social media and see how many people want to go in there. Go for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you imagine, I reckon someone out there, if you're starting a bakery chain, you should call it the gay baker. You would oh. earn a massive amounts of money right now. In this environment that we're in, that's a great idea. Yeah. If you want to go start the Nazi florist, go for it. You just <laughs> won't get many customers because no one's as stupid as you are. And there's a part of me which is quite cool with that. If you go into a baker and they don't want to bake you a cake because of their religious beliefs, why do you want to give them your money anyway? Go next door. Just Yeah. Yeah. I would just get like 20 of my gay friends, walk into their shop and all just start kissing each other. (laughs) There's plenty you can do. No, but I think the problem with that whole idea that we can just, everyone should be free to say whatever and not serve whoever they, they don't want to. I don't think that's the real world, Nick. You often talk about the real world. I don't think that would work. Why? I, like, I might be wrong. I want to hear why. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to have to try and unpack why. We've, we've spent how long trying to, you know, make this society that we live in as free from unfair discrimination as possible, and now suddenly you're going to open up the floodgates and allow all of that to happen, which is... I think you're right in that you can sort of let the free market, you know, sort of decide who wins and who doesn't. Uh, but it would create pockets of places, the little Nazi bar on the corner and things that, that aren't necessarily good. But I just, I think as a society we do, you know, and this comes back to that whole conversation earlier about what abomination means in the Bible. And I think it means whatever the society deems is culturally acceptable. And we've got to the point now where same sex marriage is going to be culturally acceptable. And so that's where we're at. Everyone needs to deal with that. Bar the priests who doesn't, who doesn't want to, that's still where I see it. I'm going to defend their church's right to be able to say no. I'm going to have to really work on this defense here. If you're a gay couple and you want to get married in a church and the church says no to you, just wouldn't you want to just go and find an actual gay affirming church anyway? But it might be the building. You might just find the building. Go, oh, that's a beautiful building. Well, that's interesting. What if they, yeah, mm, I was going to say, what if you could hire out the building, but not the priest? That probably wouldn't slide because it's their property. But yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Just thinking about the whole separation of church and state thing, one not having power over the other, like it's still, if you're a politician, you can't remove religious beliefs from parliament. You know, half of our society has religious beliefs, so they should be represented. But it's about one not having power over the other. But there's there's always going to be influence. There's always going to be uh, bias and stuff like that. 
So in one sense, yeah, if you can't remove religious people from parliament, then you can't remove uh, laws that the nation makes from the churches as well. If they make a law, then the churches have to abide by it. You can't remove religion from the politicians, from the people. No. But you can remove religion from the institution. And I disagree with you when you say that church and state needs to be separated and neither can have power over the other. I think the state should have power over the church. The church should be just like any other organisation. Like You can't say that any one organisation within the state is excluded from the rules of the state. Like we were talking about before with, you know, a Muslim group who agreed with genital mutilation or a Christian group that thought that the Old Testament was awesome and you're allowed to kill your kid if they swear at you. Like if anyone has that view, well, bad luck. I don't care if your religion says that. Our law says this. Abide by it. You don't get a choice. Yeah, but look, as I said, law takes precedence, but finding the balance is what the separation is about. You know, the state can't say you may not pray, you may not congregate, you know, and I'm not sure exactly where I stand on some, some separations and where they, you know, sort of bleed over. I'm not a massive fan that they say a, a prayer before parliament that sits each day. And I'm not a massive fan that churches avoid tax, especially when some are run more like businesses. You know, so in some cases, religion should lose a few freedoms. I've been listening a bit to your mate, Lyle Shelton. And one of the things... <laughs> Remember anti-Australian Christian lobby, Australian Christian lobby? No, that, that's just your <laughs> way of pretending. Lyle Shelton is the, the head of the Australian Christian lobby. I was listening to a podcast of his where he was sort of listing the concerns he has with uh, religious freedoms in this post-same-sex marriage world. One of the concerns he had was that religious charities could lose government funding if they hold to their religious definitions of marriage. And so mm -hmm. talking about the good that churches do in the world or religions do do in the world and in our society that, you know, if they want to continue holding to their religious doctrines that they could be at risk of losing government funding. That was an interesting issue. Why would they lose government funding if they did what or said what? Would you want uh, an aged care facility funded by the government and run by a Christian organisation to be allowed to refuse entry to a same-sex couple? Or should Anglicare be forced to offer marriage counselling mm. to gay couples? Mm. Because mm. if they just say, no, nah, we're not going to do it, I would be one of those people that says, well, that's not cool. We yeah. want our money back. <laughs> I'm not too cool with that either, mostly because I think it's a wrong belief. But should they be entitled to it? But then, you know, is someone like Lyle Shelton going to come out and say that he's feeling oppressed and persecuted is he gonna go to another country and claim asylum saying they're oppressing my religious beliefs you could um, probably go to the southern united states and get away with that <laughs> <laughs> most people would just sort of like you could that's not persecution but that's what happens when you say to people that their religious beliefs are sacred that you're allowed to believe whatever you want and we're not allowed to question them well, freedom from religion is as important as freedom of religion. Penny Wong said um, that religious freedom means being free to worship and to follow your faith without suffering persecution or discrimination for your beliefs, but it does not mean imposing your beliefs on everyone else. She was saying that in regards to religious institutions calling for protections in relation to the same-sex marriage survey. So that's what she's saying. But what you're saying is everyone should be out of free to say whatever. And you don't really care for the idea of a separation, you know, to mandate those sorts of protections. I, I don't know. I'm a bit confused. If you say no exceptions, you know, you must come under the law. Aren't you suggesting that all priests and ministers, etc., will be forced to marry everyone? I'm saying any, no, you should be able to say no. Uh, no to anyone. Right. Okay. Yep. But everyone should have to abide by the law. There shouldn't be exemptions for any religion. Because once you allow exemptions for one religion, you've got to allow it for all of them. But if you open up the discrimination laws like that, you open it up everywhere, right? So then you can discriminate against disabled people for reasons, for whatever reasons you want. You can discriminate against people based on colour. You can. Is that really the society we want to live in? Give me a negative consequence. A negative consequence. Um, okay, so the Australian Parliament building doesn't have the right infrastructure for a disabled person to 
access their office if they were voted in as a member of parliament. So they're just like, we're not going to build that infrastructure for you. So you can't be a member of parliament. Sorry. Bye. That just came to mind because there was a member of parliament just recently and they had to do some work to, to alter some stuff so that he could get to where he needed to get to. I mean, your idea that public shaming would be the, the, the recourse for people to be able to, to overcome these discriminations would be the, uh, the method that they would use to, to right the wrong. Yeah. Is, you know, yeah. I'm not trying to say there would be no negative consequences because there would be. Like, there would be costs. And, like, you are going to hear stuff that offends you and you will walk past shops that offend you. That will happen. But what I'm saying is that stuff already exists. It's just that you're not aware of it. Oh, yeah, it already exists, but we're trying to do what we can within our society at the moment to squash as much of that as possible so that it doesn't exist. And you're never going to get fully there, but the way we've been heading is to to try and... Eliminate it. Yeah, as much as we can, yeah. But so the question is, is the best way to eliminate it to remove it from the public discourse so that the only place that people can talk about it is in their own private spheres or is the best way to eliminate it to allow everyone to speak openly about whatever it is that they believe Mm. and let sound logical arguments win the day? Do sound logical arguments always win the day? (sighs) Emotional arguments seem to get a lot further than logical arguments a lot of the time. Do they? I would have thought that would be a common frustration of yours, that people don't always listen to logic. It's been mapped out to show that the human brain won't listen to a logical argument if our emotion is involved too much in the other direction. And Mm. and the more the logical argument gets thrown at us, the more we dig in deeper and deeper into the emotion. And so they don't always win. So the question, I guess the question is, when the majority are listening to the logical argument that, yeah, that sort of works. But what if you're the minority that's being logical and everyone else isn't? Well, you've got to work out a good way to communicate it. Okay. What if we go the other way? What if we say that everyone has to serve everyone and there is no discrimination? Priests have to marry everyone. What sort of a world are we in then? Because we would have people who will say, no, I'm not going to do that. I think that's what freedom is. It's a, you've always got a freedom to choose, but there's going to be consequences. So what are our consequences for discriminating? What's the consequences going to be if the person baking the cake says, no, they're a gay couple, I refuse to bake them a cake for their wedding, and they go to the government and say, they're discriminating against me. What's the consequence? Yeah, well, we don't know. There's cases in the United States at the moment that are going before the High Court. Actually, there's, there was a baker, I think, or maybe a florist, I'm not sure, that was taken to court and got off was basically said, yeah, you you have the right to say no. Because I don't know. I think that we're already living in a society which has got a certain amount of freedom. There are some limitations and the society works pretty well. So why can't we go along those sort of similar lines? And so draw a line somewhere. And I think this is probably the most likely outcome that there will be some religious protections, but they're not going to be all encompassing. No one's going to be completely happy, but it's a compromise. And I think that's workable. But you want to see complete freedom. You don't want limitations. Do you think that's a better way to go? I think so. I'm not certain. <laughs> I could be completely wrong. Like, I think we've had this conversation before that the more you push uncomfortable views out of the public sphere, the more people are forced to have those views in private. And I'm not convinced that that reduces the number of people that have those views. It just means that they're forced to have them in private. And that means that they can only have those conversations with like-minded people and they don't actually challenge their own beliefs. Because if you have a debate about same-sex marriage with someone that you disagree with, you're more likely to have your eyes opened to another point of view. Whereas if you only ever had that conversation with people who you know aren't going to call you a homophobe, then you're not going to move at all. You're never going to have your beliefs challenged. I want everyone to have their beliefs challenged. I want my beliefs to be challenged. I want yours to be challenged. I think the way to do that is through allowing, like, it shouldn't matter whether you're causing offence to someone. That shouldn't matter at all. What should matter is everyone should have the right to say whatever they want, so long as it's not causing actual imminent harm. Like, you shouldn't be able to be a priest standing up the front of a church and say, 
right, we are all going to go out and murder every Muslim we can find. You shouldn't be allowed to say that. Yeah, so you're still putting limitations on freedom, which is, you know, very sensible because you can't just say, hey, you're free to go murder. You're still drawing a line somewhere then. So So that line is it harming other people. If it causes harm to other people, then no good. But you're just talking about just physical harm as being the only harm, essentially, then. You're not counting emotional harm as being a distress or mental harm as being distressing enough to count. Obviously, it matters. Like, obviously, those things are important. Yeah. But I think freedom of speech matters more. Okay. And we did have George Brandis pushing against the Racial Discrimination Act because he wanted to have more freedoms for people to be able to say what they wanted as far as racial discrimination was concerned. Essentially, the uh, the freedom to be racist and, and bigoted and to not have to face consequences for having those views. And he said that, yeah, you should be allowed to have bigoted views and people yeah. howled him down. Yeah, they were outraged. Because people love being outraged. They do. Because if you just shout those people down, they don't stop existing. It's just that you stop hearing from them. And that's not helpful. But if we eliminate more of those discriminations and views from our society, then don't our children hear less of that as they grow up and they're less inclined to hold those sorts of views? Yeah, possibly. Possibly, yeah. But I think my job as a parent, like I don't think I'm absolved of responsibility if my son hears a racist view at school. Like I think my job is still to say, yeah, those views exist. Mm. Let's not pretend they don't exist. They do exist. There are people out there that are racist. And here's the arguments why racism is stupid and not the way to go and harmful and all those sort of things. But just saying that it's okay to say those hateful things within society... Are we just going to have more of those hateful things said? I know that you're saying that, you know, the more that they're said, the more that they will be challenged. And that's the way that you want to eliminate these hateful views is that people will be challenged instead of just crawling under the floorboards. So should it be a crime to Mm. say that the earth is flat? No. No, we should just argue against them and say, well, you're wrong. Yeah. Here's the evidence. If you want to believe it, you can, but you're stupid. Should it be a crime to not employ someone because they're black? Yeah, I don't think so. And okay. that being said, I think that's horrific. If you're someone yeah, yeah. that does that, yeah. Yeah. you're a racist idiot. What I hope would happen is that there are other, like you're creating in your own business a deficit because there's a pool of employable people out there. There are plenty of intelligent black people out there, and if you're that company that is refusing to hire black people, you are just reducing the pool of people that you can employ from. And like, if you get a black person apply for the job and a white person, and even if the white person is 10 times stupider than the black person, you're going to employ the white person and you will pay the cost for that. And the other companies that are happy to employ black people will do better than your company. But what if you're the black person that doesn't have a job and no one's hiring you because there's a lot of racism within the society? Is that fair? No. That sucks. Yeah. But that probably still already happens. Oh, yeah, of course it does. Would it change anything? Maybe it would. Like, I mean, Coles is not going to change their hiring practices. Like, if they came out and said, Aboriginals, we're not going to hire you, there would just be such an outroar, uproar, uproar is a word, they wouldn't be able to do it. Like, just the financial costs of it would just be massive. The only people that are going to do it are tiny little companies anyway, Mm. and they're probably already doing it. So what about disabled people? What about them? There are laws now around for large organisations, and a lot of them come up with their own policies and, and principles as well, but there are laws around you know, having a certain quota of employing disabled people. Oh, quotas are the stupidest thing. Ah, here we go. Really? You think quotas are a good idea? You're forced to employ someone just because they're from a minority. That is stupid. In an ideal world, you wouldn't need to address the imbalance because it would be balanced. (laughs) Yeah. But But it's not the ideal world. So we put pressure on organizations to address the imbalance. I like your idea of more freedoms of bringing things out into the open, but I'm also scared about what that brings out into the open and what, and what the ramifications are for people who are, who are a minority and aren't able to get that people power behind them for the public uproar or whatever, and it might not be fair. But yes, you're right, it already goes on. But back to what we were talking about, 
I think if you're going to force a priest to marry someone that they don't want to marry, that that doesn't work. <laughs> it's Yeah, and yeah, I'm not saying that. I know you're not saying that, but I am saying that the way our current society works is that within a secular society, with all of our businesses operating within that secular society, that you are expected to serve people free from discrimination. And I think that applies across the board uh, to the hairstylists, the cake makers, the photographers. the But not to priests. But not to priests because there is this churches do exist a little bit outside of the secular world. And you think they should exist? They should have those exemptions? I don't mind them having those those exemptions because I think that that gives them a place where they are free to hold their religious beliefs without being persecuted. Yeah, you're going to say that they're being persecuted within their secular business by having to serve such and such a person? And you don't agree with that in terms of, say, interracial marriage? Um, yeah, that's the thing where you trip me up. I'm going... <sighs> You catch me there because I'm like going, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. I do find it interesting when you throw at me because I'm I'm completely gay affirming and I'm allowing a church to say no to a couple for being gay because they believe that it's a sin and I'm completely affirming of interracial couples but I'm like going, no, you can't say no to an interracial couple. Why, Why would I say that? Where does that come from? I think in 50 years' time there'll be someone having a podcast of their own saying the same thing about gay marriage. Yeah, probably. You have to allow them. Yeah, it's ridiculous, right? Yeah. And and maybe that's where we're at. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's where the law goes now because we're still on a trajectory. We can only move so fast. Otherwise, you're going to get people really uptight. So maybe that's what you do to keep a society oiled and, and running as clunky as it might be as smoothly as possible. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, Chris. I mean, I'm, I'm all for every church marrying every gay couple. Go for it. But, yeah. They should be free not to. We're not there yet. I guess part of me is also just trying to grasp by, why someone would think, you know, serving a gay couple in their store will harm them to do so. Is God that petty? But you can understand it in the sense of if you were – this florist or this baker or whatever who's Mm. being asked to provide a service to something you don't agree with. So say it was, say you lived in a country where child marriage was a thing and this Mm. is a a 40-year-old dude taking a 10-year-old daughter, not his daughter but someone's daughter, Yeah, and you were that florist. You would just be like, hell no, I do not want to participate in this. It is wrong. Yeah. Like we would have that moral objection. I can feel that in my bones and just go, I want no part in this. So I can understand that. Yeah, I can feel that too. And if that's what they believe, if if people have these beliefs that, that homosexuality is just so wrong, I can understand that. And that's why religious beliefs are stupid, Chris. Because <laughs> none of this happens without religion. You don't think so? What, racism doesn't happen without religion? We are people that are drawn to tribes and stuff, and so the other becomes something that we fear and that we dehumanise and that we... I mean. For me, that's the argument. And so, yeah, religion is a tribe. So that's where it can more readily happen within that. Yeah. Because you're within this tribe. Yeah, okay. Um, So let me revise my statement. None of this happens without tribalism. Yeah, I think you're right there. Because as as soon as you get to know the other, then that all fades away. See how quickly you change my mind then, Chris? Cool. That's what I want us all to be like. (laughs) Let's all change our minds that quickly. But just in the interest of tribes being unavoidable... Are they unavoidable, do you reckon? So I think that's what my religion is. It's this unyielding hope that one day we will get to... One tribe. Yep. Where our tribe is sentient beings. Yeah. That's what our tribe is. And that's a beautiful picture. And that's what I'd want to see as well. What I was going to say is in the interest of getting to uh, one tribe, you know, that would be the sort of place where you would serve everyone and where everyone could get married in every church. Yeah, unless they're wanting to marry a kid, then you and I would be totally against it. Ah, see, this throws up all sorts of problems. If everyone just believed what we believed, Chris, it'd be fine. That's what I was just thinking. One tribe is no diversity. (laughs) (laughs) And so without diversity, we're all just of one mind. It loses, you know, some flavor and culture. And yeah, there is a lot to be said for diversity. 
but then that also creates different tribes. Oh, what do we do? We send our military to all the other countries, bomb them into submission, and then hand out shoe boxes filled with toys. That'll work. I mean, this is the problem with a lot of religions. As a tribe, they think that they're right and everyone else is wrong. And that can't be right, can it? Well, that's what all of us do. All of us do that. Someone could be right. Yeah, well, I'm right, obviously. <laughs> the problem I see is when people not only think they're right, but they also think the creator of the universe speaks to me and I know I'm right, as opposed to someone that just goes, look, I think I'm right, but I'm willing to be swayed by any argument that comes across my desk. Yeah, I agree with you. So, religious freedom, should we have it? No. <laughs> Definitely no. not. Freedom, should we have it? Yes, absolutely. Well, doesn't religious freedom come under freedom? It should be exactly the same as everyone else's freedoms. It shouldn't have its own special category. Okay. So, Chris, religious freedoms. Should we have religious freedoms? Yes. There you go. Done. <laughs> and that's our end, is it? The trajectory that we are on requires us to have certain religious protections, but I don't want that line to be anywhere outside of the actual church. But we'll see what happens, hey? Yeah. There's going to be some uptight people, no matter what happens with bills passing parliament and then with folk living in the new world order who think they're being oppressed. Hopefully we deal with all that civilly. Yeah, but I, I don't think you're truly allowing yourself to sit in the mind of those people who really hold those beliefs. I'm trying. <laughs> Okay, so are you truly sitting in the mind of, so the gay couple, they want to get married in the big church in the city. They walk in, they go and talk to the minister, and he says no, and they say why, and he says because you're gay. And you're like, okay. Well, you'd be like, geez, that's not a surprise, is it? <laughs> it's not like you're going to be surprised by that. You know what we should do, Chris? What? We should have museums open for weddings. Because then people that aren't religious can find another awesome building with lots of historical value to it. They can just get married there. I'd be happy to get married in a dinosaur exhibition of a museum. How sick would that be? That'd be awesome. There you go. Problem solved. Um, but where did you get married? In a church. In a church? Like all good people, Chris. Ooh. In a church that I built, no less. You built it with your own hands. I built it with my own hammer and nail. Wow. You got married on a garden path. I did. Well, a walking track, a walking track out in a national park where they actually said we, we rang them and asked if we could um, hold our wedding there. And they said no. So you did it anyway. Yep. <laughs> Jeez. Look who's the lawbreaker. You don't care about the law. So it was in a national park. They said no because they couldn't close the walking track. And we said, we don't expect the walking track to be closed. We're just going to get married on it. And they said, no, we can't allow that. And so we just went and did it anyway. We had tourists wandering right through the middle of our wedding. Like some German tourists came between Biz and I as we're getting married. And we just sort of said, hello. And they said, hello. And then they kept walking through and everyone thought it was fun. We don't need laws, Chris. It didn't hurt anybody. Didn't hurt anybody. No. So you were denied... The place yeah, that you wanted to get married in. That's correct. And you just went and did it anyway. <laughs> yes. So Chris's message in this is if you're gay, just break into the church that you want to get married in. <laughs> I'm all for that. There you go. All for a little bit of, um, what would you call that? Guerrilla marriage. Guerrilla marriage, a little bit of uh, revolution, a little bit of rebellion. You know another tribe I've been thinking about, Chris? No. Which tribe have you been thinking about? The Eternity War Tribe. Oh, the Eternity War Tribe. I've been thinking we want to hear from them. Yeah, I want it to be a community. I want to have guests on our podcast soon, Nick. I want them to be from our tribe. That's right. I wonder if there's anyone that wants to be a guest on the podcast. Well, if you want to be a guest on the podcast, let us know. If you've got a topic you think we should talk about. Mm. The only yeah. people that have contacted us have been very friendly and have said nice things about us. Dave Hammond said I, that uh, we, oh, well, he was nice. He said that this could be an important thing and we'll probably get better as things go on. Um, but, you know, he thought some of our ideas weren't very thought through and I, I thought that was very accurate feedback because we don't always know what we're talking about, but we're going to talk about it anyway. That's what we do, <laughs> right? That's a great promotion. <laughs> we just sit around wittering, Chris. Yes, thanks, Emily. <laughs> No, but I want actual criticism. Sure. 
Yeah, I like I'm, criticism. We can take it. We don't mind being yeah. offended, do we, Chris? Not at all. I, I'm very open to any specific feedback, no matter how critical. I know I'm a lot better at giving specific negative feedback than I am at giving specific positive feedback. <laughs> so if you're like that, we want to hear from you. Nick wants to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Chris has an, enough negative self-talk. Yeah, I just need my, my ego stroked. That's about it. <laughs> Good, Chris. Well done, Chris. Chris, you're fantastic. Nice, Chris. If you're a fan of Five Seeds Cloudy Cider, you can come on the podcast. Cheers, if... Nick. Cheers. Blink. And cheers to you. <laughs> Got here again. Are you shaking your head incredulously or nodding in approval? Well, if you got something out of this episode, you could really help those poor idiots by contributing to or supporting the Eternity Ward. You can leave reviews on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. You can share it on social media or discuss it in your blog, podcast or fellowship group. Subscribe, like, nod your head, raise your fist, send a hallelujah. I don't know, but don't send a prayer because I'm kind of busy right now. Join the discussion in the comments section. Of-